Welcome to our webinar series for professionals. So the event has started, our first uh, four-hour uh, webinar event. It's the first time I'm having three presenters on in <laughs> one uh, event, so I'm very excited. I hope I can work out the technique and let people in and out. So today we're going to have a focus on tests from, and they're called now Mosaic Diagnostics. They used to be called Great Plains, but they have changed name. And also their website has been launched actually today with uh, under Mosaic Diagnostics. So all very exciting and uh, new thinking, etc. cetera, from, um, yeah, previous Great Plains laboratories. So, and today is in the uh, name of Oat, it nearly sounds like some religious thing that I'm talking about, um, but where Jasmine Brown, a naturopathic doctor, will do an introduction to uh, the tests, um, to, to the oat test today. And then uh, in about 50 minutes, we will have a break, like a water in, water out break. Um, and then we will present the next uh speaker, which is uh, Dr. Vuller, that will go more into details about Candida and Clostridia. And then he will present for uh, two hours. And then we might have a short water in, water out break in the middle of that as well, before we have Q&A at the end. And of course, we will have Q&A uh, with Jasmine as well. So, um, and then at the end of that, uh, so after Dr. Vuller, um, we have um, Lindsay Goddard that is coming on uh, with a lot more in details around oxalate and health. So all very exciting uh, day. And we will, of course, record the whole event and share uh, the sessions with you. I will try and cut it up so that we have three separate sessions when we send it out to you so that you don't have to sit and fast forward if there's something that you don't, that you're not interested in. So... Yeah, but uh, yeah, apart from that, you most of you already know me. <laughs> I'm Anne Catherine um, Feilman, co-founder of Nordic Laboratories and DNA Life, where we are just dedicated and focused on uh, helping people to optimize their health through functional medicine, laboratory tests, food supplements, and of course, healthy uh, lifestyle. And uh, but first presenter is Dr. Jasmine Brown, who's a naturopathic doctor, and she just loves everything to do with education. And she is working for Mosaic and does support and uh, helps the education team there. So um, and she did a presentation with us a few uh, weeks ago, and it was very good and well attended. So um, yeah, uh, we have uh, we have we have high high hopes here, <laughs> Dr. Brown. <laughs> Sorry to put a little bit of pressure on you but uh, uh yeah exactly it will not be a problem at all so uh if you have questions or just want to chat with your lovely colleagues do that in the chat box um i will take note of any like questions that i feel is relevant and i will put them at the end of uh, dr brown's presentation for the q a um so that's kind of the the, the strategy for uh, today's event so jasmine please uh unmute yourself and get your slides up on the screen and let's get this show rolling <laughs> All right, thank you, Anne Catherine, for that introduction. All right, let me bear with me, guys. All right. Can we see it okay? Okay, I'm going to put you guys down really quick. All right, so thank you again for having me. Um, I'm like Anne Catherine said, I'm all about education, and um, I'm just really grateful to be able to um, go through just an introduction of our organic acid test. If you guys were with me um, a few weeks ago, this might sound familiar, but that's okay. This is information that um, you really do want to hear, kind of want to repeat. Um, so I'm always glad to give this presentation. Um, so let's jump right in. Um, as Anne Catherine said, I am a naturopathic doctor and one of the clinical educators with Mosaic Diagnostics, and I've been interpreting this test uh, for the last three years. Okay, so our objectives for today are first to discuss the importance of organic acid testing, um, describing who could benefit, 
understanding some of the most common conditions supported by this profile. I'll then dive deeper into um, a majority of the analytes that we are testing. And then I'll wrap up with some other profiles to consider um, once you, you know, got your results. All right, so our organic acids, uh, well, what are they, right? Um, these are acids that contain an organic radical. Um, think of things like citric acid or acetic acid. And through our profile, what we're looking at are the organic acids that are produced by living organisms, including us humans, bacteria, and fungi. By understanding them, we get a understanding of how the human body is responding metabolically and kind of what's inside of us too, and how is that functioning metabolically and how that's affecting us. Now, the origin of this test, um, if you have children, um, you know that typically at birth, there is that newborn screening test. They will prick the heel of the infant to rule out rare inborn errors of metabolism. Think like um, PKU, maple syrup, urine disease, these rare conditions where we're not processing amino acids properly. Um, and if these conditions are not treat it properly, we will start to see potentially things like poor feeding, seizures, little to no weight gain, nausea, vomiting, illness, infection, and in the unfortunate cases, death. Now, this uh, profile, again, it kind of want to think of it as a peak inside to metabolic functionality. Okay. Now, why should you even order this test? Um, and why is it so valuable? Well, for one thing, it's super easy to collect. It just Give your morning urine, right? You can do this in any age group. We also actually have a pediatric collection bag. So for your uh, non-potty trained um, individuals, you can still do this test. Um, you also get a wide range of information. There's 76 markers just from one urine sample. Um, and it's very useful because we're looking at functionality no matter what stage of life you are in or what diagnosis, we can get some information about the body's cellular and metabolic response and how we can best support them, no matter what they're going through. Now, specific supports can now give us more, um, we can give, have more confidence in what we're specifically giving based off of these analytes. This also helps us to get some understanding of underlying causes. So is there, you know, an oxalate issue, a fungal issue, just maybe just nutritional need, uh, we can really get a sense of that. And then I always like to use this as a first line test. Um, but remember, it can be done at any point in the healing journey. Now, the way I like to think of this profile, um, I always describe it as a roadmap. Um, oftentimes someone comes into your office and you're like, okay, you have this laundry list of symptoms, where do I start? This profile is a really great way to kind of get your bearings. Um, it can confirm some of your clinical suspicions, but I will say don't go in with specific expectations. Remember, it can also open new doors that maybe you weren't thinking about, and then it can close some doors that you've either been going through uh, repeatedly or you've been thinking about going down that might be closed for you. And even though sometimes that might be... Um, unexpected, it can still be very helpful for your uh, clients. Uh, some of the doors, if you will, that uh, can be opened are GI dysbiosis, oxalates, mitochondrial dysfunction, neurotransmitter imbalance, nutritional deficiency, toxin exposure, and genetics. Now, our key areas of focus on this profile are the intestinal microbial growth, and I'm going to go through all of these in more depth for you, so no worries. Um, those oxalates are glycolytic and mitochondrial metabolites that help us to evaluate for energy production, or dysfunction, or functionality. In our neurotransmitter section, we then have pyrimidines and fatty acids, which give us understanding of folate metabolism and how well we're using fat. Nutritional markers um, just gives us that kind of functional nutritional status. Then we have our indicators of detox, one of my favorite sections. Um, and then those amino acids, that's that um, section that is more tailored or uh, reminiscent of that newborn screening test that I mentioned earlier, um, those metabolites. All right, so who would benefit? Who are you gonna run this thing on, right? So just kind of a, 
overview that oat provides useful information about how well the individual's body is functioning. If imbalances in function are revealed, then these imbalances could be contributing to several disease processes. Um, now, by addressing these things, we can improve associated symptoms and support overall health and well-being. Now, diseases that are associated with metabolic imbalance and nutritional deficiency that we really see a lot of um, support with this profile are anxiety, depression, obesity, insulin resistance or diabetes, autism, GI dysbiosis, fatigue, and just, you know, your person who wants to biohack or uh, just overall optimize their health and well-being. Now, from my experience, my three years, the most common things that I see um, well-supported are fatigue, anxiety, autism, depression, GI complaints, pain, especially chronic pain, fertility issues, Parkinson's, cognitive decline, OCD, ADD, and autoimmune condition. Now, some of the less common um, diagnoses or conditions that I see, but still find this profile to be very helpful are going to be more of your dermatologic complaints like eczema or psoriasis. Um, I've seen a few cases of chronic herpes and acne be well supported with this. And then I have had the occasional case of hallucinations. Um, so that's just from my personal experience as an educator. Now let's jump into the analytes that we're measuring. Our first section, again, is that intestinal microbial overgrowth. Now we have three different sections, fungal, bacterial, and clostridia. The fungal section, we have a specific unique candida analyte. We then have aspergillus, excuse me, analytes, and one fusarium analyte. Our bacterial section is nonspecific. And then we have a, a very unique clostridia section. These are specific toxins to these, this family of bacteria. And um, just so you're aware, they do differ from your kind of traditional toxin A, toxin B, I have diarrhea toxins, but they are coming from the same organisms. Now, this is that first section. When you first uh, get your profile, this is what you're going to see at the top of page one. The first marker you should dry your eyes to is number seven, arapinus. This is that specific candida marker. Now there's no tag under it. So sometimes what I'll do or have new practitioners do is just write it in. Um, just so when you go back, you know to dry your eyes to it. Now our orange tagged markers, as you can see the aspergillus ones and fusarium, those are your mold uh, specific markers. So definitely keep your eye out for those. And as we kind of talk about mold, remember mold produces toxic byproducts called mycotoxins. And we do have a mycotox profile that helps us to get an understanding of that mycotoxin excretion and load. And these tests are complementary to one another. Uh, one, you can actually run them on the same urine sample. So there's um, no need to collect your urine twice. It also gives you information about mold and mycotoxins and functionality at the same time. So if you're running these things separately, you're oftentimes wasting time um, because you're gonna find out, oh, there's mycotoxin or, or oh, there's mold growth, but then you have to recollect, you have to wait to get it sent to the lab, you then have to wait for results to be ready, and then you can start uh, the rest of your treatment. But if we're doing them together, you get answers right away. Um, and then realizing that these two really need to be done together because mold growth is different than mycotoxin exposure and excretion. You can definitely have either one simultaneously or apart, and you just want to make sure what you're looking at in each case. So definitely consider doing those together. Now, in 2019, the Great Plains Laboratory, uh, before we switched over to Mosaic, uh, published this Towson article, and this was uh, by Dr. Shaw and Dr. Matthew Pratt Hyatt. It's called The Biochemical Markers in the Urine Associated with Gastrointestinal Mold Overgrowth are Linked with Elevated Urinary Mycotoxins in Patients with Suspected Mold Illness. Now, this is important because this compared elevations of mycotoxins in the urine to the organic acid mold-related growth markers in the urine. And as you can see here, um, the red is your mycotoxin-positive um, 
participants. And as you can see, those organic acids are much higher than in our non-mycotoxin positive individuals. And then the second graph is showing us the actual toxins that were positive. And then this last one shows us the same thing, but in relation to more of that um, tricarbolelic or that marker that is related to fusarium. Okay. Really cool article. Um, if you can, um, it's pretty easy to find. So uh, check it out. So really good read. Okay, so now we're going to look at our bacterial markers. Remember, these are non-specific, so it doesn't give me anything like, oh, this is H. pylori or this is Klebsiella. It's just bacteria. So it's really just a good kind of screening, like, hey, should I move forward with further um, stool testing or other GI testing? Now, a common question I get, is this telling me there's SIBO? Okay, so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Unfortunately, we cannot diagnose SIBO from this test because we're looking at urine. These metabolites can come from the small intestine, the large intestine, and there's no real way to say this is definitely the small intestine. But sometimes as you're seeing these elevated, they're having that uh, feeling of fullness or bloating, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea. You can actually get some information that says, hey, these things are overgrowing. Let's do that further. SIBO testing, um, but remember this test cannot diagnose it. Now, the last section on page one is your clostridia markers. Again, these are specific um, toxins to clostridia species, number 17 being uh, specific to C. diff, uh, that for cortisol. Now, these toxins differ from toxin A and toxin B. These toxin A, toxin B toxins are actually just rubbed in the tight junctions in the gut, and that's what's causing that uh, diarrhea. Um, that's completely different. It will uh, look at that on a stool test. But these toxins are actually more neurologic toxins, and that's because they come from amino acids that also are needed to make our neurotransmitters. And we'll dive a little deeper into this, but basically at this point, what you want to understand is these toxins and our neurotransmitters look very similar. And because of that, they are blocking an enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase or DBH. Okay. So basically what happens, the clostridia takes the amino acids from our diet. Um, the amino acids they're specifically taking are phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and these are the amino acid precursors to your dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and the tryptophan to your serotonin. And what happens is they block that enzyme. So your dopamine cannot become norepinephrine and epinephrine. And then we get this whole imbalance um, that we'll discuss a little later. But um, I say all that to say that section, those four markers are going to be very important for you to draw your eyes to on every single oat that you have. Okay, let's talk about those oxalates. So oxalates are crystal-like structures, as you can see in this picture, they're like pointy, sharp. So a lot of times you'll see pain, and that's any kind of pain. It can be stomach pain, headaches, migraines, uh, vaginal pain, joint pain, any type. This is also commonly seen in the autistic population. Um, so definitely think about that if you have an um, autistic individual uh, coming to you. The three metabolites that we're looking at are oxalic, glycolic, and glyceric acids. And then we want to make sure that we're evaluating these because they are connected to candida overgrowth, mold exposure. They're also associated with the need for B6 and can lead to that mitochondrial dysfunction. So what we want to remember about oxalates is that they come from a compound called glyoxalate. This is a main source of the formation of oxalates. Um, they're derived from amino acids and fungal organisms. And basically what happens is our human lactate dehydrogenase takes that compound and converts it into those oxalate metabolites. This also happens from ascorbate. So if you're taking massive amounts of uh, vitamin C, you can induce this. There's also some from glycine, but it's only about 1% of the glycine pool, so not much. Um, and then these precursors is how the human body forms them internally, okay? Now that candida connection here, you'll see this on page two of every organic acid test that you get. 
basically what's happening is candida, when it overgrows, it lyses our isocitrate and produces glyoxylate. So glyoxylate is then worked upon by that LDH to become these oxalate metabolites. Now, some good news about this, if you have adequate B6, we can shunt that back into that glycine. And remember, that's only about 1% of the oxalate pool. So it's really a safer metabolite in the grand scheme. So B6 is a really great therapy option when you see high oxalates. Now, treatment considerations here, I often get that question, and do I need to do a low oxalate diet? Um, mild elevations, so slightly out of that reference range. If they're eating massive amounts of like spinach, berries, soy, chocolate nuts, yeah, go ahead, reduce those things. Um, if they have severe pain or um, severe autistic symptoms, whatever their symptoms may be, then you might want to consider reducing those higher foods. Now, a value over 250, that is a time where um, I would consider doing more of a low oxalate diet. Um, so you definitely want to take into account what symptoms you have, how severe they are, and then how high that elevation is. All of those factors will help you determine how restrictive you might need to be. And then there's that section on um, how it presents on the profile. Okay, so the next two sections that we're looking at are the glycolytic and mitochondrial analytes. And these analytes, I always like to look at them as a whole picture. So that's markers 22 through 32. Now, what it's doing here, we're evaluating the use of glucose via glycolysis for ATP production. We're also measuring urinary byproducts as a Krebs cycle, those intermediates. Then that last section in these three evaluates the function of amino acid usage for energy metabolism, okay? Elevations give us insight into dysfunction and the ability of the mitochondria to actually produce this energy. If these metabolites are building up and coming out in the urine, that tells me that the enzymes needed to actually convert these into the next step of the process aren't quite supported the way that they need to be. So that tells me that there's increased metabolic demand, whether that be from nutritional deficiency or clostridia or candida or toxins or oxalates. Um, and from there, we can then say, hey, we need to figure out what these factors are, remove them, and then also give those nutritional supports. Now, this is what that section looks at. These first two are your glycolytic, lactic, and pyruvic. Now, these give you an um, insight into how well the body is actually using glucose. Now, if we go back to biochem, uh -oh, and the usage usage of glucose, we produce pyruvate. Now pyruvate has two destinies. Either it's going to become acetyl-CoA via pyruvate dehydrogenase or lactic acid via lactate dehydrogenase. Okay. Now if there is an oxygen-rich rich situation, meaning you're well oxygenated, you have enough hemoglobin, you're going to go down this pyruvate dehydrogenase and make acetyl-CoA. You're going to then go through the citric acid cycle. And then the citric acid cycle, look, you're going to make two ATP here. And then you're going to go into the electrolyte transport chain and make a net of 32 to 34 ATP. So this is a very efficient process. Now, if there's any hiccups in the citric acid cycle or the electron transfer chain or in pyruvate dehydrogenase, pyruvate either builds up or your body says, I have to make energy somehow. So it goes down to less efficient lactate. And in this case, you're only making a net of two ATP. Two versus 32 to 34, that's a big difference. So we always wanna take a look at these two markers and see how well are we using that pyruvate. And if that lactic is high. Now, when you look at this section, the second uh, analyte that you want to make sure you're drawing your eyes to on this entire profile is 24 succinic so acid. This marker is um, such a godsend when it is elevated because this is related to toxic exposure. Now, I can remember early on in my career working with this, I had a organic acid test that only had this marker high. Everything else looked beautiful. And this was at like a 300, it was crazy. 
and turned out this person was severely exposed to herbicides and pesticides and that was really all that was wrong um, so this analyte with elevated can be uh, very telling and you always want to look further for uh, chemicals metals or mold toxins now this is special not only because we know there's toxic burden but it's special because the enzyme that converts succinic acid into fumaric is succinate dehydrogenase. And it's the only enzyme to produce, participate in two different parts of energy production. So it participates in the Krebs cycle and complex two of the electron transport chain. So if this is blocked and you have all this acidic acid coming out, you not only have energy production cycle issues, you have two areas. So these people are usually gonna be very fatigued uh, when they have a lot of that succinate coming out. Okay, so our next section are those neurotransmitters. Uh, this is definitely a section you want to be patient with yourself and learning and understanding. Uh, but what you want to remember, this is a overview of urinary um, metabolites of um, neurotransmitters. So it's not the actual neurotransmitter, it's the breakdown byproduct. Dopamine being that homovanillic acid or HVA, norepinephrine and epinephrine being that vanilla mandelic acid or VMA, and that serotonin being the 5-hydroxy acetic acid or 5-HIAA. Now, symptoms will give you clues and the values will give you clues on what may be going on internally. So because we're looking at end products, this doesn't necessarily tell you how much is in the body. It tells you how much came out. So if you have a lot coming out, we can imply that there's a lot going on inside. If there's a little coming out, we can imply that there's a little going on inside. But depending on symptoms, there may be a lot of neurotransmitter and poor breakdown. So you always want to ask those questions and you always want to uh, relate this to who you're looking at, okay? Uh, now, we do have a special ratio there, HVA-DMA ratio. This evaluates the activity of that dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme um, that I mentioned with the clostridia. So that's that enzyme that converts our dopamine to norepinephrine and epinephrine. That enzyme isn't working properly because it's blocked or there's a SNP or there's a lack of cofactor, whatever it may be, you're going to see that ratio increase, okay, because there's more. HVA to VMA. Now, what does this? So we know that the clostridia toxins block it. We also know that there are cofactors here. Those cofactors are copper and vitamin C. So definitely take a peek at that vitamin C marker on the organic acid test. That can be super helpful. Um, but also consider copper testing. Um, I see a lot of people, especially uh, during the pandemic, when it was you know much more... Um, we're much more isolated. Lots of people were taking zinc like crazy and unknowingly depleting themselves of copper, throwing off this enzymatic functionality. So make sure you're checking serum coppers, um, or you can consider our copper zinc profile that we offer. And then sometimes there's a SNP in that DDH as well. So if there's no clostridia, those cofactors are normal, then you do want to consider um, genetic testing. Now, this is a depiction of that section, okay? So uh, first you'll have your HVA, your, your VMA, and then there's that ratio. This one actually looks pretty good. And then and on page seven, this is a really nice kind of breakdown of how that phenylalanine and tyrosine are being used by these organisms and creating these toxic byproducts. So the way I like to think of it is Dopamine, forcrystal, HPHPA all come from the same parent, phenylalanine. And because they come from the same parent, they're kind of like cousins, if you will. So they look very similar, but they're different. And so these toxins are actually blocking the receptor sites on DBH. So dopamine only can go down the other pathway of becoming HVA, and that's why it builds up. And this is an issue because it's neurotoxic um, associated with things like autism, OCD, anxiety, depression, fatigue, Parkinson's, um, cognitive decline. So we can see a wide range of uh, symptom presentations when we have that elevator ratio. Okay. Now, 
Now we have another ratio that we look at. Actually, I'll show you here. Uh, number 37, the HVA DOPAC. This is a really nice ratio because this gives us understanding of the catechol old methyl transferase enzyme or COMD. Now, what this enzyme does is it inactivates our active catecholamines. Okay, so it breaks them down into those HVAs and BMAs. And this bottom depiction shows us that other route dopamine can go. Okay, so it can become DOPAC. And then from DOPAC, it's worked on by COMT and becomes HVA. Now, if that ratio is high, that HVA DOPAC, that tells me that COMT is fast. It's breaking down dopamine very, very well, maybe a little too well. If that ratio is low, then that tells me that DOPAC is building up, right? If you have a lot of DOPAC, not a lot of HVA, then this COMT is sluggish. So things you'll think about, you know, are um, cofactors like CME, magnesium, even lithium is um, required here. So that's definitely what you want to keep your eye out for as well. Uh, yeah, so as you can see here, uh, kind of the same thing I just mentioned, you know, it fully breaks down these neurotransmitters and then increased activity will increase the ratio, decreased activity will uh, decrease the ratio. Now, the last couple of markers on this section are the quinolinic and kynurenic. These are neurotoxic byproducts of excuse me, tryptophan metabolism. Um, quinolinic's production is usually stimulated by immune activation, viral load, Lyme, toxic burden, and um, the need for NAD. So that uh, compound is needed in mitochondrial functionality. And when we don't have enough, we'll upregulate this process to make it. So at the very least, it's NAD or B3. Chynurenic. Now, this is another byproduct of tryptophan metabolism. Again, it's usually only elevated in certain situations, like inflammation, and then also it's commonly elevated in B6 deficiency. So make sure you're giving that B6 when you see chynurenic. Okay, so let's move on to ketones and fatty acids. Your ketones, remember, these are byproducts of beta oxidation or your primary process for metabolizing fatty acids. This occurs inside of the mitochondria and it can metabolize all of your fatty acids. So short, medium, and long chain, um, but easily it's going to break down your short chain fatty acids. Now your medium and longer chain require L-carnitine for the carnitine shuttle so they can get into the mitochondria and then be used. We can see this upregulated in normal situations like fasting. So if you have an intermittent faster or someone who's on a specific low carb or keto diet, you'll also see this in calorie deficit. So think about picky eaters or in anorexia. You can see this in diabetes, uh, blood sugar, metabolic dysregulation. You'll also see this in chronic diarrhea and vomiting. Uh, so think about your um, bulimic individuals. You might see this as well. Lastly, and this is the most common, but sometimes we'll see it in a chronic large fungal overgrowth. It's usually after these other things have been uh, ruled out, okay? Now, the other markers here, 45 through 49, are called dicarboxylic acid. These are secondary metabolites. These come from omega fatty acid oxidation, okay? So this is a process that happens outside of the mitochondria. It's kind of like um, a backup senior for beta oxidation. So when the lead either is overwhelmed or we don't have enough carnitine or not enough nutrients to run beta oxidation, we have to deal with those fats somehow. And we use a less efficient process outside of the mitochondria. And that's where those dicarboxylic acids come from. Now, this section is looking at the mitochondrial function and usage of fat as an energy source. And like I said, it can be influenced by that diet. So here's that section, the way it's depicted on the profile. And then remember, 43 and 44 are your actual ketones. Now, our nutrition analytes, um, our pyrimidines are looking at folate. Um, we analyze your cell and thymine, and these are related to RNA and DNA uh, synthesis, and you need folate to synthesize uh, these strands. So if these are elevated in the urine, we know we don't have enough folate. Now the B12, B6, 
uh, B5, B2, vitamin C, OQ10, NAC, and biotin are also analyzed. As you can see, there's a couple that have asterisks. That's important because those markers are functional markers. I mean, we're not actually looking at the vitamin itself in the urine. We're looking at a metabolite that's breakdown or production is dependent upon that particular vitamin. Okay. Now you'll, um, some people will forget this. So I always like to remind everyone that there is this note at the bottom of the page. Asterisk means a high value for this marker may indicate a deficiency of this vitamin. And that's when it's high, okay? So that asterisk will always be there. Now I'm gonna point out number 55. Do you see this one? How this one's starting to creep upwards? Well, that tells us that there's something's going on with the production of CoQ10. So 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaric acid, or uh, more commonly known as HMG-CoA, okay? So this is the compound that is worked on by HMG-CoA reductase. This enzyme helps us to make CoQ10. It also helps us to make cholesterol. Now, if you're familiar with statin drugs, you know that statins actually block that enzyme and that's how we reduce cholesterol, right? Well, when this is blocked, HMG-CoA increases and that's why number 55 when elevated, it tells us, okay, something's going on where we're not able to convert that and make more CoQ10. Now, this is also important if you're working in a pediatric population um, because cholesterol is also typically affected here um, in those cases. And a lower cholesterol has been associated with autism and speech delay. So it's definitely something that if you see that high or high normal, go ahead, give that CoQ10, but be sure you're uh, looking at that total cholesterol as well. Okay, so one of my favorite sections is the indicator of detoxification, because this gives us an understanding of how well the body is actually processing our toxin. So the pyroglutamic acid, that one has an asterisk as well. This is our functional marker for glutathione status. So the higher the elevation, the more in need of glutathione your body is. Uh, basically, the faster your body's trying to pump this antioxidant out. Now, the 2-hydroxybutyric, this is produced when homocysteine uses cystathione beta synthase pathway, or CBS. Then we have erotic acid. This uh, gives us understanding of how we're... Uh, uh, excuse me, metabolizing ammonia. And then the 2 hydroxyhypuric this is produced by GI bacteria uh, when overgrown or in the presence of aspartame intake or salicylates. So um, think about like diet soda, um, sugar-free gum, um, the aspartame or salicylates like certain foods or um, aspirin. And this is what that section looks like. And then those asterisks, you just have those notes here at the bottom, okay? Um, now, I'm gonna point out specifically to hydroxybutyric acid because at the hub is homocysteine. Now, homocysteine, just my cursor, there it is. Okay, so homocysteine can, we know, use the methylfolate, uh, the methyl B12 to become methionine. That's how we recycle it or we can use this CBS pathway to produce cysteine, okay? Because we know if homocysteine rises too much, it's actually inflammatory. So our body has two internal ways of regulating how much homocysteine is available. Now, in some cases, you're gonna see number 59 or that 2-hydroxybutyric acid elevated because this person's not methylating. They don't have that methylfolate or their MTHR is um, effective, or they need that B12, or they need that um, TMG or betaine. In other cases, what you're going to see is 2-hydroxybutyric acid being produced because homocysteine is being converted into cysteine. Now, the only time 2-hydroxybutyric acid is really produced is when we are trying to make cysteine from homocysteine. So when you see that, we then know that the cysteine is being produced for then feeding that glutathione status. So if you're seeing that elevated, it's always good first line um, next step is to go ahead and check that homocysteine. Because if it's too high, we know that we have a methylation issue. 
if it's normal or low, there's usually a need for glutathione support and then further toxin testing. Okay, so our amino acid metabolites, remember this is that a section that's associated with the newborn screening. Um, these are measuring metabolites that are linked to the inborn errors of metabolism, including things like um, maple syrup urine disease, BKU. Elevations are usually consistent with genetic dysfunction. And when I say elevations, I mean like 50s and 100s. You're going to see crazy numbers. You're probably going to be a little freaked out when you first see it. Um, but that's where I, uh, us educators are here to kind of help walk you through that. But this is not going to be typical. Most people that have these conditions, um, at least nowadays, are going to be well supported um, or already know that they have that. Now, what I do want to make clear, this is not a measure of amino acid status, including intake or digestion, okay? Um, you can see low values in vegans, vegetarians, omnivores, carnivores, because we're not looking at intake or breakdown. We're looking at once you've intaken these amino acids, once you digest them, can you actually use them, right? Can you metabolize them and transform them into the next parts of wherever your body is using these. If these enzymes aren't working, that's when these metabolites start to build up and there are toxic byproducts. Else like elevations may be linked to nutrient need, like um, in particular 62 through 66 are looking at maple syrup urine disease type metabolites or on the use of branch chain amino acids. And that's a B1 dependent process. So sometimes you'll see people slightly elevated or slightly off that low. Um, and it's like, oh, they need some B1. So it can be helpful there. And then again, the more you do this, the more keen you'll become, become on these markers and these numbers. Okay, so some common things, uh, just questions I get. Um, can the oat serve as a screening test for mold exposure? So again, no. Um, the oat tells you about growth. The mycotox tells you about toxin excretion. You can't have these things together, but you can't have them separately. So don't let that oat fool you if it comes up not telling you anything about mold. Um, I then also get that question. Are analytes 15 through 18 specific to toxigenic C. diff? Again, these are different toxins. Okay. Um, do the mitochondrial markers elevate, excuse me, evaluate any specific area of the body? Not really, um, you know, any cell that produces energy is going to have a mitochondria. So we can be getting, we'll be getting information from all over the body, but you always want to think about mitochondrial rich tissues. So the heart, the brain, the nervous system, the muscles, these things are full of mitochondria. So that's where you'll be getting a bulk of your information. Um, I also get where in the body or brain are the neurotransmitters measured against the urine test. So it's a nice overview. Um, and then why are the elevations of the mycotox and now O in the mold um, analytes? Again, one is telling you about growth, right? So growth of an organism. And the other is telling you about toxin load. So organisms are living, growing, thriving versus toxins that are non-living metabolites. So that's why they can be um, mismatched, if you will. Um, and then again, I get the question, do amino acids tell me about protein status? I mentioned this again, because it does not. Uh, please don't let uh, that confuse you, okay? Um, now, lastly, we're gonna talk about some other profiles for you to consider. Um, I kind of talked about some of these, but we'll just go back through them. Um, the mycotox, GPL tox, and glyphosate. Mycotox, if you have mold markers, of course, look for those toxins. If you have oxalates in the absence of candida, look for those mycotoxins. And again, best done at the same time as the organic acid test. Now that GPL toxins is our chemical profile. Uh, this is really a nice um, profile that we offer. If you have 24, so that systemic acid I mentioned, make sure you're um, evaluating this test. Um, because it's blocking that succinate dehydrogenase enzyme causing that marker to elevate. And then glyphosate. So number 24, um, definitely you look for glyphosate as well, but it's really important if you see resistant clostridia. So if you're treating clostridia with probiotics, uh, biocidin or other antimicrobials, and it keeps popping up, 
look for glyphosate because glyphosate, like the way it works, unfortunately, is it targets a specific pathway in um, organisms. And unfortunately, Clostridia doesn't have this pathway, but our good bacteria do. So if you're constantly getting exposed to this from your air, your water, your food, your Clostridia is just like having a party in your gut. So you want to make sure that you're removing that factor. And then we have heavy metals and DNA methylation. Heavy metals, again, if marker 24 is elevated, you want to rule out toxin. And then 59, so, you know, remember that 2 hydroxybutyric acid, we're breaking down that homocysteine. If you check that homocysteine, that homocysteine's high, you want to know what SNPs am I dealing with here? You know, is it just MTHFR, is it MTRR, um, or some other more obscure um, SNPs? So definitely consider our salivary DNA methylation SNP panel. All right, so our takeaways. The oat is beneficial for any chronic disease patient or anyone really who's just looking to get health, better health overall. Various symptoms, disease processes can be supported by this profile. Our common um, analytes are our intestinal overgrowth, oxalates, mitochondria, neurotransmitters, nutrition, and detox. And then our other tests that I want you to consider are mycotoxin testing, GPL tox, chemical testing, heavy metals, and then, of course, that DNA methylation SNP panel. All right. What questions do you have for me today? Thank you, Dr. Brown, for your excellent presentation. Um, just a few questions has come up. Um, uh, one is, and that's, of course, a challenge with vitamin C supplementation and high oxalates. Uh, in the urine, so if the oxalic acid is high, is um, is is high, uh -huh. and would you have a low vitamin C marker? And how would you would you just take vitamin C, or how would you handle that challenge? Yeah, so my typical recommendation there is, if you can get it in food, um, that's just good practice anyway. Make sure we're eating vitamin C through our food. But if you're looking for the antioxidant support at higher amounts, I typically find if you stay under 1500 a day milligrams, it's usually okay. Uh, you just want to make sure you're breaking that up. Um, I wouldn't give that whole dose at once. So maybe like, you know, break it up twice or three times a day. Okay. And then another one comes up here from Camila. Um, if low aconitic acid marker 28, is that an indication for something particular? So we haven't found any clinical significance to that aconitic being low. Um, one thing I will say, aconitic comes from the citric and the Krebs cycle is also known as that citric acid cycle. So typically what I'm looking for with the low aconitic is also a lower citric. That usually tells me there's not enough um, if fuel, if you will, for that cycle. So I usually like, recommend um, adding some citric acid um, in those cases. Okay. So then, of course, the big question in regards to Parkinson's, I guess it's like using the oat test, if that will be relevant uh, or if it can help reverse and control the situation. But I guess it goes a little bit with all function. But when, I mean, when functional when we're working with functional medicine we're not per se dealing with a diagnosis we're dealing with biochemistry and we are working with the foundation and the cells and the mitochondria and the energy production and the detoxification and when we are working on that we may be able to to well at least do health optimization if we can <laughs> fix a disease i yeah sometimes we can <laughs> yeah, it's really about optimizing. Um, and there are certain patterns, right, that we see with Parkinson's in particular. Um, I've seen it with clostridia, I've seen it with mycotoxin exposure, I've seen it with, you know, a combination of things. So uh, it's really just kind of like I said, don't rely on with expectations, but go in and understanding what you're looking at and how to support those um, dysfunctions. And that oftentimes will um, support the person that you're sitting in front of. Excellent. Thank you very much.
uh, time is up. So it's actually um, time for, oh, now, now lots of questions are coming in. <laughs> um, I'm just looking at quite, they're quite specific. And um, I think, I think we have to take the, the break and I need to get uh, Dr. Vola in as well. So um, Dr. Brown, I'm going to say thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we will record it and we will share it with you all. So you can go in and listen to it as well again later. Um, we will keep it in BMS. Um, so uh, yeah, just keep a look out, look, look out for your email. So we're going to have a break now. So you can go and have some uh, something to drink or go to the bathroom, etc. And then we will... Uh, start again at uh, in well I better say nine minutes because I don't I'm not going to say Copenhagen time because you guys are all over the place <laughs> so we will start in nine minutes uh, with Dr. Vola's presentation so um, yeah enjoy your break and see you soon and uh, Jasmine thank you very much I yes thank you yeah, a great day <laughs> thank you as well um and you guys got some great speakers coming up so enjoy yeah we do have excellent speakers coming on i'm very excited <laughs> okay All right. if you do not already have an account with us please contact our team and we will assist you if you found this webinar helpful please like and subscribe to our channel